So I hope as you listen from week to week to the show that you really understand that my uh, a passion and my objective with the show is to help you change and whatever it is that you need changing in your life so that you can become the sales leader or the salesperson um, that you should be. So you're out there helping more people and coming from that place of love. So I hope you get that vibe every time you listen. Additionally, if you do love the show so much, I would love for you to either go on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen or watch the show. Please do a review, rate us, and leave your comments. I do read them personally, and I'm always touched to read how you guys um, feel about the show and feel about me. So again, please rate, review, and send some love. Um, I truly appreciate it. So my motivational quote today is actually by a website called Tiny Positive, and it says, relationships get stronger when both of you are willing to understand mistakes and forgive each other. So do you have a solid and healthy relationship with your significant other? And are you able to be honest and playful with your partner? Or do you always need to kind of be the one that's in control? So what does this all mean? Well, of course, today I have an amazing expert. Um, Her name is Laura Doyle, back for the second time. Now, Laura has a passion for helping women fix their relationships so they feel desired, taken care of, and special no matter how hopeless it seems. Now, Laura was trying to save her own marriage when she um, stumbled on some ancient wisdom and wrote a book that accidentally startled, uh, I'm sorry, accidentally started a worldwide movement, My Kind of Lady, of women who also want to fix their marriages and make them playful and passionate again. Now, thousands of women from all over the world uh, world have reached out uh, for help. So through coaching, online programs, live events, and an Amazon Prime series, um, Empower Wives, Laura is able to meet that demand. Now, her and her team of over 40 coaches have helped over 15,000 women with their confidence and their marriages. She's been a guest on the Today Show, Good Morning America, The Early Show, The View, The O'Reilly Factor, The Bill Maher Show, and of course, here with me. <laughs> so please help my welcome. Please help me welcome my amazing friend and guest, Laura, to the show. So, Laura, thank you so much for being on, taking the time, and you know, coming to play and share all of this great wisdom for us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on again, Connie. Yeah, and I just want to share uh, before we started recording. I I was talking. We were talking about you know the heartfelt sales leader, the podcast. You know, I had recently rebranded and. It, would it tell them what you said to me, which struck me so funny about the, the heart and sales? Well, I said, I always think selling is love. Did you hear that all? Selling is love. Uh, it's so true. And so I just, I giggled and I said, it's sad that people don't feel that selling is love and sharing and providing solutions for those that we are lucky enough, I think, to help. So thank you for that. I just had to share because, you know, sales, it's kind of my world. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, people, it does get a bum rap, right? People have the wrong impression of selling. They don't see it as love, but gosh, if you've got something so great that you know is going to help people and you want to share, I mean, isn't that coming out of love? I think it is. hundred percent. You speak in my language, Lori, you speak in my language. So let's, let's shift over a little bit because we're still talking about love, but we're talking about relationships. And I know you feel the same way I do that we have to have healthy relationships both at home as well as in our professional lives. And when we could find that wholeness and that happiness, I think we thrive in every area of our, our business, our life, our, our um, jobs, careers, whatever it might be. Now, you say women are making a big mistake trying to get their husband's attention and affection. And why, why do you think that is and what do you see happening out there? Well, I just think back to the battle days in my marriage when I used to uh, put my hands on my hips. My husband's watching TV, right? And I would march in and say, you know, the average couple has sex two and a half times per week and we haven't done it in two weeks. So I think we should do it. And, you know, I thought he would just like jump off the couch and like maybe dip me back into a passionate kiss and like carry me into the bedroom. But that never happened. And looking back, it's kind of obvious now that, you know, to see why. So my approach was very controlling and I didn't know that I was controlling just like fish are always the last to know that they're in the water. Right. I'm like, what, what do you mean controlling? Um, until, uh, we were in marriage counseling actually. And, uh, the counselor pointed that out. She was like, I don't, you know, I wonder if you notice that you're kind of controlling. 
and like hear the record scratch like oh, we were, you know like, <laughs> what we're here because he's the he's the problem all the, right like he's not paying any attention to me i think there might be something wrong with him he doesn't even want to make love to me uh and of course it was very lonely and painful yeah um so it's great to get that insight that i was controlling um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, my, my counselor, my marriage counselor's suggestion was, yeah, you know, try to stop being so controlling. And that was just no help at all because I thought, well, I don't want to be controlling. It's just that I'm the only person that's making things happen around here. You know, if it wasn't for me, like the house would be a mess. The cars wouldn't get maintained. The bills wouldn't get paid. I have to do all these things or nothing is going to happen. But little did I know there's a totally different approach, much more effective that, actually draws my husband to me like I call it an irresistible magnet uh, as soon as I get out of the way and let go of that control but this is a common thing that I see uh, thousands of my students have come to our campus because they recognize as I start to describe like the ways that I was controlling in my relationship you know I frowned at the lettuce he bought because it was iceberg and everyone knows that's d devoid of nutritional value. And so, you know, I didn't say anything, but I sort of kind of scowled at the lettuce or I would ask him leading questions like, are you going to wear that to the party? Uh, it, and, you know, I, it perfectly in my mind, but really not. There was a subtle criticism. So I actually have my uh, I have a list of like the top 10 ways to control your husband. None of them work, but, they, you know, I've tried them all embarrassingly and uh so this is just something we, we i commonly see that especially uh when women become mothers we have such a big responsibility for such a vulnerable little being it just seems really um almost appropriate that we should control and tell him how to do things and unfortunately that repels our husband that makes us absolutely repulsive never gonna draw him closer to put your hands on your hips and say, you know, I think we should have sex, like I used to do. So, you but sexy woman, you. You right? sexy woman. Like, <laughs> and, but here's the funny thing. At the time, you think, oh, he's going to jump off the couch. You go, yeah, baby, yeah. Let's, let's go in the bedroom. And it, right, it right. really, it has that opposite effect. So now you mentioned the top 10 things that you see. Can you share what those top signs are that maybe we are controlling, but we don't think we are because we think we have to. Everything you just said, I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, right? Yeah. What are those top things? Well, I would say the number one most common way that women are controlling without realizing it is that we try to help our husband. We're going to show them how to make a resume or, yeah, that was that was a big one for me. Or we're going to, um, you know, like point out that parking spot or, you know, maybe the, that they should get in the other lane, right? Like being, being a passenger can be hard sometimes, right? Uh oh, Connie's like covering her face. Like, I think you really, I feel that I'm among my people here. You're among your so, people. Uh, anything any time a wife is trying to help teach her husband something in my experience that is the same as control in fact there's absolutely no difference between being helpful and being what i consider now a controlling shrew because who i mean think about your mother on her worst day when she was maybe telling you uh you know what you should do with your life or you know who you should date or what right like it's repulsive. We just you just want to get away from that. You just you leave tire tracks in the driveway, right? Trying to get away from control and help being helpful. Uh, you know, you're gonna show him something. You know, like how to diversify his portfolio or whatever. That is always gonna come across as uh, a a, re a repellent instead of the desired outcome, which is like he's gonna benefit from your knowledge and you'll both be better off. And the reason for that, and this part was so surprising to me is that underneath the urge to control, there's always fear. Fear is what it's really about. So I'm scared, I'm trying to get him to course correct because I think I'm gonna have to wait longer, be you know, work harder, be lonely, uh, pay more. Something bad's gonna happen to me if I don't tell him what to do. So it's really the opposite of like, of trusting somebody, which is exactly what we do when we're first falling in love. Like, right, you just go, oh my gosh, you're the most amazing, most capable, talented, funny person. And then at some point, that familiarity really does breed contempt. And you start to see, you know, like he exercises his right to be wrong, right? Which every husband has that right to be wrong and it's going to exercise it from time to time. But it, it's, it can be scary. And so then that fear arises. And then that's the moment where you get to decide, am I going to use 
am I going to act on this fear? Am I going to be controlling in this moment? Or am I going to choose my faith, my trust in my husband, um, and, and let him maybe get some life lessons instead of wife lessons? Life instead of wife. I, I really love that. And yes, as you were speaking, you know, we're driving to my sister's in North Jersey and, you know, the the roads in New Jersey are very heavily trafficked all the time, not just at rush hour. So we're heading up. We have my mom and dad in the back. We're going up for some events and well, pre-COVID anyway. And I'm like, um, are you going to pass that person? Like, yeah. you, and he looks at me and says, the maniacs are out. I'm not there. There's no fire that I'm rushing to. Like, in other words, he politely tells me, can you sit there and mind your own business? And yeah. and I inevitably I do. And he, then he says, do you want me to pull over and have you drive? And I always laugh because he handles me well. So, Laura, here's the thing. My, my husband truly does handle me well. But everything you've said, I I definitely have done. So you are amongst your people. Here's the other funny thing. When we, I remember right before we got married, I was with my mother-in-law. We were doing something for the wedding and she was helping me. And it was really kind of cute because it was just she and I, and we had never really been alone without my husband or my father-in-law, whatever. And she said to me, you know, do you know what you're going to call me after? And I'm like, oh, I haven't even thought about it, but I can't keep calling you Mrs. Whitman, right? Because that's weird. And I, through our conversation, you know, from that point, from that jumping point, we started talking and I said to her, you know, your hus your son is perfect. And she took a step back at me and I said, wait, let me rephrase that. He's perfect for me. So now, isn't that interesting what you just said? I just reflected back on that moment where truly, truly he was perfect for me. I saw that clearly and he is still perfect for me. I see that clearly. And yet in between the almost 30 years that we're married, it's you're going to get in the left lane and you get to pass this guy. Have you done this yet? What about the laundry? Right? right. And that's true. And yet I still know my heart is perfect for me. So women, everybody, my peeps, are you hearing this? <laughs> Yeah, it, well, I love that story. That's a beautiful story. He's perfect for me. And that is how every bride starts out, right? Like, totally. Oh, he's, he's, he's perfect. Or maybe not even perfect for me. He's just, he's just perfect. And it is interesting how something happens over time that we feel like we uh, want to step in. And then, and then we think like, oh, my gosh, I've made a mistake. I've married the wrong man. Like he becomes distant. Absolutely. Uh, he, or, you know, even really... Uh, some really dire painful circumstances can come out of this what we see a lot is women uh, on our, arriving at our campus because they're having a huge breakdown where he's having an emotional affair or an actual affair yeah. with someone at work who still sees him as that capable Perfect. confident guy yeah. that he you know he really needs to feel that he is that's Absolutely. just kind of part of being a, a man uh, they have that need and it's sad because we think that we're trying to improve them. That's the first problem, right? Because they yeah. should worry about their own crap. Um, but aside yeah. from that, that's that's not our responsibility. And that, that creates the wedge, not the connection. So now you have said that marriage counseling, which is funny because you went through marriage counseling. Yeah. But yeah. you said it, sometimes it actually does more harm than good. Can you talk to people right. about that? Right. Absolutely. So I, I know for me, when I went to marriage counseling, I was there so she could finally fix him and then I could be happy. So I hmm. didn't go to self-examine. I wasn't there because I thought, you know, there's some things I could probably be doing better. <laughs> no, I thought he was the problem. And so that just never works, right? You can't, I, there's this one more, it was like the most expensive way. That's on my top 10 list. It's the most expensive way to try to control your husband is to say, we need to go to marriage counseling, which he will hear as, you are a terrible husband, yeah, really, right? Yeah, Your failure yeah. as a husband is big criticism. So right there, you've actually kind of dug your hole a little deeper just by even saying that. That was one part. And then the, the next piece that I learned in retrospect, I didn't see it at the time, but so no couple has ever gotten happier by complaining about each other for an hour a week. And sometimes that's what happens in marriage counseling. I think most, of, most professional marriage counselors got in the business to help. They really mean well. But unfortunately, the setup where you're both there talking about the problems, like focusing on the problems, is a pretty toxic one because what you focus on increases. So I just remember us having a lot That's of fight true. on the way home from it. And I mean, I thought our counselor was good. She seemed really caring. She listened really well. And you know, I, th I thought, well, we're going to get somewhere someday. And uh, so what happened was 
uh, she, I was diagnosed with depression. My husband was diagnosed with a common mental illness that there was some medication he could take for it. But so that was the good news. Bad news is it's really hard on your liver. <sighs> but I was like, well, it can't be that bad because otherwise they wouldn't prescribe it. Right. Right. Like I was just desperate. Like we need something. Let's like, uh, What's the but, fix? right. It's a fix. But I remember just like a year later after that being on the, the gray, the drab gray couch at the marriage counselors and realizing this is hopeless. I'm going to have to get divorced. This is, he's never going to change. And, and therein was the issue. He's never going to change. Right. So I wasn't even looking at my own responsibilities, the things that I could change about myself. Sure. Uh, and that was where I really found the power. I, I, I wanted to get divorced real bad, but I also desperately wanted to have a happy marriage. So, and I was also too embarrassed to get divorced because everyone had been to the wedding just not that long ago. So mm, yeah. I ended up interviewing women who had happy marriages and just asking them for their secrets. What, what are you doing? And they just said crazy things. I didn't make any sense to me really, but, um, I decided I would just start experimenting with them. If it worked, I'd keep them. If it didn't, I'd throw them out. And I just remember I'd been doing that for a little while and I uh, came through the door and my husband's face lit up. He was happy to see me again. And that had been gone for so long. So I knew this was working. So what is the first thing a woman could do just based on what you just said to empower herself um, to shift to that more playful, passionate relationship, even when like you're at the point where th this is hopeless and, yeah. you know, divorce is inevitable. How do, yeah. how do you make that little pivot or shift so that people find hope again? Right. That's really what we're talking about. Right. So this one and it's so funny because uh, especially if you're in a crisis, like a lot of women, my students will show up and say, I'll say, okay, here's the first step. And they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, that's good. But what, what, what can I do to fix my marriage? I'm like, no, this really, this really is it. Okay, let's just kind of review for a second. And I that love it. is, it's, yeah, it's to, um, I, I call it uh, self-care, soul care, mm -hmm. making yourself ridiculously happy. So a lot of times, like the, the woman that our husbands fell in love with, right? She was having a good time and feeling good about herself and had her hobbies and her friends and all that. And then a lot of times we've just kind of gotten wrapped up in, uh, you know, the house, the mortgage, the job, the what, and we've gotten sort of serious. I, I know for me, I forgot who I was. And, you know, a lot of times I say to my students, I, I want to reintroduce you to yourself. You are the goddess of fun and light. And that's who your husband fell in love with. And if you're feeling like you're unhappy because of your relationship problems, like I felt the same way. But the part that was really surprising is it's not my husband's responsibility to make me happy. In fact, he couldn't do it Absolutely. because I was so committed to my misery. At some point I just got really like uh, martyr like, and I was, uh, hmm. I had depleted myself. I was exhausted all the time. I was uh, working and, you know, just doing all the housework because I was doing it my way. And, you know, I was controlling, I was trying to control him to do it. And that was backfiring so much. Right. So he was, he had really dug his, heels in like I'm I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna do things your way when you tell me right so I felt like he's just so irresponsible and um and we see this a lot right where totally the, and then you make the case like oh okay well he's just a big loser pants so that's um uh, I guess you know I'm just gonna have to suck it up and and do this so finding what made me happy again and that so for me that included like I love to play volleyball now that's my my one of my big passions but even just something simple but I consider it an act of courage like taking a nap just realizing like okay I'm I'm out of it like I'm I'm too tired to be pleasant right now nobody better cross my path or they're not gonna it's not gonna go well for them I'm just going to march myself into the bed, you know, for 20 minutes or something and just give myself that break. And it's so funny. I'll get up from my nap and my husband's all like, Hey, what you doing? How, how are you? What's going on? You know, hi, hi, hi. And so that magnetism returns as soon as I restore um, my presence of mind. And, and this is really important, Laura, what you're saying, because women, I think women, probably men to, to a large extent, we forget 
to do that self-care and that self-love. And they really do go hand in hand to give ourselves that downtime or to give ourselves permission to not have to, you know, work all the time or take care of the kids all the time or to be the director, right? We have to be the director. And I remember one night we were in bed and, you know, it's funny, pay the bills, do the housekeeping, do this, this, you know, the kids were little. And I, and then I started my business and my kids were one in four, right? And it was just go, 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 do, 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 create, 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 B, B, B. And I remember one night in bed, I, I said to my husband, so I'm the general. And he's like, yep, you're the general. And I go, guess what? Here's the baton. You're now the general. I want to be the soldier. You tell me what to do and I'll do it, but I'm done being the general. I'm tired. I'm worn out. And it was the funny, this made us just laugh even harder. And he, so I'm, I'm handy fit, like visually saying, here's the baton, take it. And he's pushing my hand back. I don't want that baton. Right, <laughs> right. And I said, ah, so it's okay for me, right. To take on this responsibility. And it was interesting because it spurred a conversation of, you know, the next, we laughed, right. We went to bed. And then the next day I said, you know, I was, I wasn't totally joking around like I'm tired and I I can't call all the shots I have 50 balls in the air and and it's a lot like I can't keep doing this and he said well what do you want me to do and I think I shared this in the last one I'm like can you do the laundry in the food shop and like I just it's another thing that I have to fit in and done like that was it uh, done but it was that conversation of I don't want to do this anymore like I am worn out and you know trying you know trying to start a business and you have two babies at home you can't even think straight because you're still up in the middle of the night and all those things and I have to engage and train and talk to people you know where I'm like you know doing blah, blah, blah. It, it was it was craziness but you have to ask I think and but let me tell you something because I am a control freak too Laura it's hard to ask for help because it's a sense of failure a sense of vulnerability a sense of um I can't do this I'm not good at the whole all those record players right the screeching of the record player of I'm not good enough what based on all that what's the number one way that women that are listening especially can become that irresistible magnet that you keep mentioning right how do how do we do that well, it's funny you should talk about how hard it is to really kind of say I can't do something because and to look what happened. I just love your illustration, too. Right. He started he stepped up with the laundry and with the food prep and and really in some ways that actually did contribute to making you an irresistible magnet, if you can believe it. And I was raised the same as you. Connie and I think so many women who are listening, right? Like I can, I can do anything I want, right? I can, I can do everything. And, and that's the part where it gets to be the lie, right? I can do everything. No, I can't. Uh, it's too much for my nervous system, but I, I can, I can yeah. do anything I want, but I, I can't do everything that I want. And for, for me, it was really shocking to learn that when my husband sees that vulnerability, when I get to the part where like, I'm like, I, I, you know, I can't, this is too stressful for me to pay the bills. This is, I can't, I can't handle this. It's hard to say. It makes you feel squishy inside. And it's one of the most attractive things ever. Vulnerability is part of what creates the fascination that leads to lifelong commitment. So when you said, I can't, you know, laundry and food, and he's like, I can do that. He got to be your hero and save the day like, ta-da, I made dinner, right? And you got to be like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I feel so taken care of. Absolutely. That creates a virtuous cycle. So that actually is one of the key, uh, that's one of the, the six intimacy skills is finding your vulnerability. It's even, um, you know, letting your authentic tears show. We distinguish that from waterworks, which can kind of have like an underlying complaint or manipulation. Sure. But when you're authentically sad, like you're worried about your mom because she's sick or, you know, I, I, you know, something or, or you're just scared because you're giving a talk tomorrow and you're just not sure you're ready for it or like that piece where and he can come in and be your knight in shining armor. Super, super magnetic. Yeah, and this is important. So my mom, uh, several months ago, she, my parents are, my dad's 90, my mom's 91 at this time. And so a few months ago, um, she had a tear in her intestines. So at 91, going through surgery, like you can imagine. So, and the, the medication for anyone who has elderly parents, when they put you under the anesthesia, and then she's pretty good with the pain, but they had to give her a little bit of the morphine after to get her to be able to rest and, and sleep. Well, the medication wreaked havoc. She was hallucinating. 
we thought, wow, like she's losing her mind, this poor, this poor little woman, right? So my siblings and I were trying to be round the clock because you never know when the doctor's coming in. We had to advocate for her. Um, she was giving the nurses a hard time, which isn't like, so all of these things. So, and I was trying to launch a master class. So I was working 12 hours a day and then trying to pull away and get to the hospital. And then she was in rehab and go to the end. So we were trying to have all this coverage. And I remember um, my siblings were like, well, you, you know, you have to do. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll do it. I'll make it work. I'll make it work. And I'm thinking, how am I going to make it work? I can't create more time. So like I was spiraling and I remember I came home and I don't cry, Laura. I'm the type I cry when I, when the stress has reached such a pinnacle point, it's definitely a release for me. So I'm not a crier. Like you said, the waterworks, the drama not me that's not who i am and i remember came in and i i sat down and he looked at me and, he go, and i burst into like burst into tears and he's like what and i go how do i like how do i do all this i i, I like i don't want to let my parents down i don't want to I don't want to, you know all of the things that were in covid and i was creating this whole new division within my company and you know you know it's 12 hour days seven days a week and i, I don't mind doing that but now there was this layer of life of responsibility and I tell you, I, I, I thought, this is it. They're going to put me in the funny form because I, I, I can't, I have to sleep. Like at some point, I have to actually sleep. And he just hugged me and he said, we're going to set boundaries. We're going to do this. You're not, forget about the launch. We're postponing that. And he just logically, and it was everything I should have known, but you're trying to be everything and do everything and create because now income had stopped because of COVID. How can I bring income back? All of these pressures from every area of my life, right? My kids are now home and COVID, it, you know, it, it was mayhem. And he just said, this is what you're going to do. I'll text your sisters. I'll ba 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 ba. And I looked at him and I was like, I, like, oh, but I was drained, but I, I said, oh my God, like, how did you just do that for me? So that's the hero. But, but can I tell you, it took a long time and I, it, I don't let that happen often. So I hope everybody listening is understanding that that point of total vulnerability and of I'm, I'm lost now. I, I couldn't find my, I couldn't see the path anymore because there was so much coming in on me. One person, how do you do this? And, and my siblings don't have businesses, so they have no idea the commitment right. that it takes because you go to a job, right. you come home and you're done. I'm never done. Uh -huh. So never what, done. this is, but, but how many women do you see that we think we can add more, add more, add more, oh, yeah. and you have oh, a yeah. breaking point. So it's, it's hard to be vulnerable. I, I, I totally um, hear that. What, what are the biggest challenges that you see? Cause you're talking to the pandemic, right? Every, like I had a shift, I create a whole nother division within my business. That's a lot of work. What are you seeing with the pandemic with couples? Cause I'm, sh I'm sure my story is not alone. Definitely, you're not alone. Although, um, I just applaud you for like how, letting it just be okay that you kind of, I call it the accountable mess. You're like, I just, I, I can't, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, you know? So, <laughs> that was um, it. At least you're not blaming him. You're not saying you're not doing enough or, you know, it's, it's your fault or whatever. It's just, it's just what is. And really, uh, you know, obviously he rose to the occasion. So, um, it tells me you really were vulnerable. And it is. It's, it's like, I think it's an act of courage. It's, so scary to be vulnerable. So, so I really love that. But uh, and one of the things that we are seeing with the pandemic certainly is, as you described, there's just tremendous overwhelm all over the place. But I think one of the kind of hidden pitfalls of being uh, secluded with your family for 24/7, like yeah. all, you know, all everybody, uh, is the lack of solitude that happens, right? Maybe there used to be that moment where like the kids are off to school or you're commuting to work or you're just in your office with the door closed and you had that, even if it's only like 10 to 15 yeah. minutes um, of alone time just to be yourself and, and nobody's pulling at you or wanting you to do something or perform. So, uh, and so that kind of, that goes on the self care list for me too, or the soul care list of like, how are you going to create uh, some some solitude. I have uh, one coach who's uh, got. She still has two young, you know, really little, tiny people at home, and she's trained everybody in the family that Mama gets a two-hour break in the middle of the day, and she uses it to nap or journal or just listen to music. And but she's trained everybody like, hey, if you want to have a happy Mama, then and they and the kids know you can't ask for a hug or a drink of water or a snack. 
during that time. And that she says that has really been a key to keeping uh, the pandemic, you know, keeping the quarantine a happy quarantine for the whole family. It's all, it's keeping everybody steady. So boundaries can make a big difference to get yeah. that boundaries. That solitude. You use an interesting word in that description just then. You said that we feel like we have to perform. And that was, I was like, hmm, that's a good word because we feel like with, if I'm with a client, I have to be on. If I'm training, I have to be on, right? Your energy has to be way up here. You come home, the kids need the attention, how was school, whatever. You have to be up here. Then the husband's talking about, you have to be up here. We're in performance mode. And then when you get in the bedroom, you feel like you have to perform again, right? right? Even when that's you're right. super, super stressed out. So perform, what a, what a great word, because I think we often feel like we're constantly performing the next task you know, performing what that next um, layer of whatever it is I have to do in my day. What I have a really curious question. We're almost out of time, but what if the husband's the one that's the controlling one? Oh, yeah. You know, very common complaint, too. Uh, and so and then and then like sometimes a, a woman will come across my material and say, well, this would be great if he would read it. He just needs to read it. Right. And it's kind of ironic in a way because it, it's still a form of control. I want to make sure he's less controlling, right? It's so it, there's uh, so absolutely the intimacy skills are the best possible way to deal with a controlling husband because we're all teaching each other how to treat us all the time, right? Mm. You, you and I are having this conversation right now, and there's certain you know, the way that we're talking and uh, you know just the eye contact or whatever we're teaching each other how to treat us. And that's also true when your husband's controlling. And so sometimes there's uh, unwitting ways that you might even be scaring him. I had this uh, in my marriage where because I was one foot out the door all the time, I kind of always had my running shoes on and my bags packed like I'm getting ready to leave this relationship. Well, that was terrifying for my husband. And what's underneath control? Fear, right? Yeah. That's what causes people to be controlling. So a lot of times, so for me, there was just a lot of work to do in, um, apologizing for having been so disrespectful, having been so quick to kind of throw out um, my commitment, you know, to disregard the vows that I'd made. And once I did that and he really got the idea like, okay, she's, she's really here. She's in his fear subsided, the control subsides. And then I could also use the tools, like one of the tools um, that we use commonly on our campus for teaching someone how to treat you is um, using the word ouch. So he might be telling you how to cut an onion, right? And you're like, this is so annoying. And you can just let him know like this ouch, right? And, the, and the, you don't usually, to be honest, you don't usually get a great response initially. He's like, ouch, ouch, what is ouch? Like, and it's because they're feeling some conviction, right? So if, if I had said, you know, you're being such a jerk right now, you're telling me how to cut an onion. Like, I don't know how to cut an onion. And then they just hear our voice, right? They can defend against that. But if you don't, if you don't do that, if you just are kind of owning just ouch, right? You're not saying you hurt me even. You're just saying I'm hurt basically uh, in so many words. But even I like the word ouch even better than I'm hurt because it's just so yeah. even a two-year-old knows what ouch means. Right? Absolutely. Ouchy, right. So and then they feel that conviction. And so very often you get an apology. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to out you, right? And that, and that, it might come a little bit later, but uh, it's, you know, because you're changing up the old dance, right? If you've got a long-standing dance yeah. of him telling you how to cut an onion, and you telling him he's a jerk, and then he says, well, you never listen, or whatever, right? Like you go back and forth with that. When you change up the dance, it takes a little bit of an adjustment, but it's well worth it to get past that hump, so that you're both treating each other uh, respectfully. It just can go so far towards creating a sense of peace like you are eliminating those fights before they even start yeah it's crazy because like we we get caught in the story we have our own story but now we have our couple's story and you end yeah. up repeating the pattern over and over and and really what you're describing is is right what's called in psychology pattern interrupt that okay this has not worked and it's the dance is the same dance the same two-step we're going to stop the music and we're going to pick new music and now we're going to do the waltz it's literally a pattern interrupt that we're, we're 
or that you're really recommending everyone yeah. does. And that's it, it you got to do something. You want to change something with definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? right? We're crazy. Right. So you have to do that pattern interrupt. Something has to change or nothing will change. And that's that's the bottom line. I want we're out of time, but I do want to share your website. So listen, you, you got to check out Laura. Um, join her at Laura, Laura Doyle, dot org, And I'm going to put the website, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to put the link because it's blog and then how to get your husband back. But it's got hyphens and all this stuff. It's, it's, I'm not going to read that out because most people are either driving or vacuuming or working out. So right. it's all good, peeps, right? I, I will post that in the show notes specifically for you so you can find Laura. But I do highly recommend you check check it out. And if you really, if your marriage is really in distress, please seek seek this kind of help because number one, it's a holistic kind of approach. Um, it's that we're our own reprogramming that, you know, you heard my story, you heard Laura's story. We're all the same, right? We're all coming. Like as she was saying, I'm like, uh-huh, I do that every time. Are you passing on the left? You know, we it, we don't even realize we're doing it half the time. So we need to educate ourselves as to what it, what am I doing, see it with clarity. And then that's when the change, right? We could put position these pieces of change. And here's the other piece for me as a business owner, you, you know, as a business owner, if you can't be happy at home, you're never really going to be fully happy with your business and you're never going to be able to totally connect um, with your clients. And we started the show by talking about love and I believe and I truly teach how how to love your clients. But for me, I love my clients and I share my love very freely, but I'm also very transparent and vulnerable with them because it's, it's honest. And to me, I just, I want everybody to know who I am, where I'm coming from. There's never a hidden agenda, but I do that at home as well as with my clients. So everything we're talking about, man, guys, it, it, it works absolutely in the household, but it could absolutely work with your clients or your, your bosses or whoever, you know, whatever your uh, business looks like. So thank Thank you, Laura, for this. It's um, this is an important topic. This is a really because at the core of it, it's all about the relationship, and I'm I'm all about building client relationships. Well, shouldn't I be building my relationships in the home as well? So these skills are duplicatable no matter where we go, right? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for being on. And I promise, guys, lauradoyle.org, and then I'll put the blog and everything. Connect with her, pick her brain, get, you know, hire her, uh, read her books, whatever it is that you need to do. But you really need to, we all need a little Laura in our lives, <laughs> uh, needless to say. And you guys, just go to my website, whitmanassos.com. The show is there. The show is posted there, um, all the updated um uh, links, uh, my free resources, my book, my ESP, Easy Sales Process, number one international bestseller. It's there. My masterclass, it's there, ESP masterclass. So go to WhitmanAssos.com. I will post that in the show notes as well. Come play with me and all of the platforms that I'm on. Laura and I love helping uh, people to share the love. I guess really that's the easiest way to put it, right, Laura? totally is you nailed it yeah yeah thank you so much thank you always for being on and we always have such great conversations and we get a couple of giggles in there too which is always really nice right hey this is life we gotta have fun yeah absolutely 100 being on thanks for having me always a pleasure um so check out lauradoyle.org and uh connect with her again whitmanassos.com connect with me uh also please please go on apple podcast rate review send me some love or YouTube, subscribe and uh, send me some love on the comments there as well. Always appreciate it. Um, If you are watching on YouTube, make sure you do the subscribe and write on the comments. Thank you, Laura, for being my wonderful, wonderful guest. And I hope you guys will join me weekly as we question, build, and discover together that building a client relationship, building that love, sharing our wisdom and our expertise It's easier than you think. And I truly hope my guests and I and the tips and strategies and ideas we share with you, take them, implement them now. It's all about action and getting those results. Make it happen, okay? Uh, You've been listening to The Heartfelt Sales Leader with me, your host, Connie Whitman, on webtalkradio.net. I wish you all a wonderful week where you just open your minds to what is possible and start loving and building those relationships that help you thrive and not just survive. Thanks, everybody.